today we start with the bio art, the biological experimentation. So as my colleague said, uh, we are the curators, curators of these three specializations, but although they are divided, uh, we also collaborate. So I think this workshop is the proof of how the three specializations can intersect each other and, and in the end you will have a product of these three fields all together. Uh, so um, my name is Laura Rodriguez. I, I'm a Mexican artist, but I'm mostly based in St. Petersburg in Russia, but currently I'm now in Mexico. And I came here to, to make some exhibition in, in La Paz in the north of Mexico. And I dedicate most of my life to science in biotechnology, but the last four years I moved into bio art and technological art a bit. So my interest is mostly the interactions between other species and the empathy towards all different entities. And today I, we will start with a brief intro of what is bio art and the difference and the intersection with biodesign. So I'm very excited to hear that all of you have uh, interest in this area. So I think it won't be just like a lecture. I would like to hear your opinions. Uh, what is your, what, what do you think about the artworks that will be presented? So please, in any moment, you are welcome to turn on your microphone and make some questions or make some comments. Anyway, I will be, I will be trying, I will try to ask during the whole conversation. Uh, because I want to hear. I don't want that this will be just a monologue. I'm very interested in you. You are uh, very interesting people for me when I hear all your backgrounds. So I'm very happy to make this workshop together. Yeah, maybe continuing the words of Laura, uh, we would like to give you shortly the structure of the workshop. Now, probably you already saw it from our email. So we will uh, start with experiments in biological art, starting to set up uh, a set of experiments which will bring us uh, to the next step of uh, uh, digitalizing these archives of biological matter by the means of the algorithmical tools, where I will jump in the following day to this step. Uh, further on, uh, we will move on to the virtual reality and here Vadim will start working with you, creating a new type of the physicality, which is virtual, of these uh, biodigital species. So, um, and if you see in the calendar, basically we are uh, going from one person to another one, introducing all these different steps. And at the end, we expect that we'll have a set of biodigital uh, drawings presented in the virtual uh, reality. Uh, so just uh, if you follow step-by-step step all the workshop, I think you will be intuitively driven through this trip and we will have all the beautiful results for the finals when we will have review of your final work where we will give you the word uh, again to present and to talk about your work. So on this moment, um, I need to disconnect to start another workshop. <laughs> and uh, I give the word and the, the stage to my colleagues and I'm looking forward to see you in the day two. So good luck today. Bye-bye. See you soon, Maria. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so hello everyone. Again, I will try to share my screen. Please let me know if you can see it. Can you see my screen? Yeah, okay, perfect. So um, as we already discussed, today is the first part of the workshop that is mostly dedicated to bio art. Um, and uh, a little bit more about my background. I made a molecular biology master degree in Skoltek in Moscow, but then I made a master in art and science in the Center of Art and Science in Edmund University. But now I work there uh, as a coordinator of the bio art specialization and uh, also as an independent curator. And I think that what I like the most about working here in the Art and Science Center is the opportunity of access to all the labs because Edmo University is also an engineering and technological 
Institute. So they are laboratories of nanotechnology and chemistry, uh, robotics, and um, working there not only as a biological artist, you have access to all of this. So uh, I right now I'm trying also to learn more about other fields to intersect my projects with the biological background. That's why I'm also very happy to be in this workshop and I will be attending the, the next sessions uh, from Vadim and Maria. So uh, what do you know about bio art? Um, I would like to hear what is your, what do you think is bio art? I think it is the art that is inspired by nature. Mm -hmm. Inspired by nature. Any other ideas? Uh, I think maybe it's about manipulations with uh, natural structures and um, mm, using uh, basis of nature and creating something um, um, made by human beings. Okay, so we have inspiration, manipulation, good. So uh, when I try to explain to my family, like what do I do as a bio artist, they mostly think that I paint with bacteria, but I have never painted with bacteria. <laughs> um, and I want to make a very, uh, a, a difference between what is an artwork with biotechnologies uh, biotechnologies, I mean bacteria, uh, DNA manipulation, plants, uh, the whole ecosystem, the universe. Like bio means life, right? So in the earth, life starts from the very structure of the DNA to the whole universe. So bio is a huge field of, of study. Um, so I want to make the difference between a craft of with biotechnologies and an artwork with biotechnologies. So what we're seeing here, it will be considered as a craft, is the reinterpretation of a famous painting from Van Gogh uh, made with some bacteria uh, in these uh, petri dishes there, the, the circular containers. Um, but it cannot be considered as an art uh, because it is a replica, is something that, um, it can be reproducible and re, re, be repeated by someone else as well. Uh, so if this will be considered as a craft. Do not misunderstand me. I don't want to say that it's less worthy or something. I think it really requires a lot of talent to create something, to craft something with biotechnologies. The, if most of us will try to paint something for first time with bacteria, it will look mostly like this. So you still need to, to have practice and a craft with biotechnologies could evolve to be an artwork of biotechnologies. So bio art is inside of the field of contemporary art called art and science. And in general, this field is about making alliance. Uh, when we are in the laboratory, you can imagine robotics laboratory or biology laboratories. The scientists were mostly used to see the, the other entities like robots or bacteria as objects. They use them for a purpose, I don't know, for develop a medicine, to create a faster producing life. But in art and science, these entities stop to be objects and they become subjects. They become the protagonist. They have a, a, a value as uh, actuators in the production. So uh, in the case of bio art, the protagonist will be the, the part of bio being alive that goes from proteins to structures and organisms. And why are we talking nowadays so much about bio art? Well, because the last century, we have the boom of biotechnologies. We discover the DNA. Uh, we start to understand the, the genome. The genome is the, the group of genes that are in the DNA of human or in different plants, animals. So we start to understand how that works. And there was genomic therapy. Uh, we start to modify organisms. So 
it was a boom in science and art is always reacting to the society. Art is a fragile entity that reacts to, to what is happening around. So therefore, uh, artists will start to wonder how to use these techno techniques and technologies as part of our creation. So uh, I think that one important moment for bio art developing was the discovery of DNA by Watson and Crick. And I don't know if you know the story behind that there was another um, important character, in this case was Rosalind Franklin. Um, she was a scientist, but we're talking about this, the 60s or 70s in, in the Academy of Science. And there was very difficult environment for a woman to work in science in that moment. For example, Rosalind was not allowed to enter to the coffee room of the scientists. It was only for male scientists. And she developed a very strong personality in order to survive in this uh, environment of science. And she was making pictures uh, with crystallography of different uh, small molecules, even the DNA. So uh, there was. Well, in that moment, she didn't know there was the DNA as such. Uh, but Franklin had a collaborator called Wilkins, and he was a very good friend with Crick and, and Watson. And in a moment when Crick and Watson were visiting the laboratory of Wilkins and Franklin, um, Wilkins showed to them a picture from, from Rosalind Franklin that she took in the nucleus of the cell. And they saw this famous this is a famous picture, the first selfie of, of the DNA, let's say like that, uh, when you can see the structure of a double helix. Maybe you cannot see it because sometimes it's like, you know, when, when you have an ultrasound and, and they say, yeah, the baby is there, but you only see some shadows. But maybe this will give you an idea of how they identify there was a double helix. So you see like an X here is this part of the double helix of the DNA. So Watson and Crick published the paper uh, using the research of Franklin, but did not include her in the paper. So they were awarded with the Nobel Prize. Uh, and only years later, the name of Franklin was recognized that she already had passed away. Uh, so uh, the Nobel Prize cannot be given post-mortem. Uh, so she couldn't receive the recognition she deserved. Uh, that's why I like to mention uh, when I'm talking about the DNA to, to clarify the role of some important persons also in the discovery of the DNA. So if I tell you a single concept of what is bio art, it will be very silly of my part because it's still in development. But I really like this uh, description that was made by Joe Davis, that is a very famous uh, living bio artist. Uh, and George Church, that is a synthetic biologist, and they work together in Harvard University. So they say that bioart is part of contemporary art, but adapts the scientific methods or technologies uh, uh, bi and biotechnologies to explore the living systems from DNA, bacteria, cells, plants, animals, ecosystems, forests, the, the sea. But they study them as an artistic subject. So it's not an object anymore. It has some agency. And the topics that it can address, I think, is not only the mention they mention it here, like philosophical, societal, or environmental issues, but as any other topic that you would like to address with artistic approach. But what is important that is trying to erase or blur the boundaries between art and modern synthetic biology. So well, now I tell you what some people think that bio art is, but some other very intelligent and important people in the sphere of, of art, like the curator Jen Hauser, uh, that is working every year in, in Ars Electronica. He also has uh, uh, this quote that is very important nowadays, that he say, there is no bio art, or there is only bio art. Actually, Ars Electronica, as you might know, like there is considered as one of the biggest festivals of art and science, does not have a, 
a field or a award for something called bioart. Uh, it's called Cyber Arts and Living Systems. So in, in that festival, the word bioart do not exist. Uh, why Jen says that there is no bioart or then everything is bioart? Because there is always an observer and a creator. And the observer usually is alive. So if it is alive, it's bio. Uh, there is always a person beholding the factor of bio, biology. And bio art has had another type of names like, like transgenic art, living art, hybrid art. And the most recently that I heard was in a conference from China, it's called Pan Bio Art that is taking a more Eastern approach to the use of technologies because bio art had the boom in the Western society. So it was also very driven by the Western ideologies and Pan Bio Art is trying to contrarest this movement that was established in the last 50 years. Okay. So um, then there is also some misunderstandings of what can be bio art and what cannot be. Uh, there is a, a classification made by the curator, um, Daniel Lopez del Rincón, that he is working in Quartis Barcelona Institute. And he make a distinction in three, three branches. One is biothematic, for example, when there is typical, or not typical, let's say like fine art methodologies, in this case, like painting or sculpture, that use topics of biotechnology. And an example is the Alexis Rockman painting called The Farm in 2000s, uh, when you can see here in a speculative scenario of a farm where we are using pigs to harvest human organs or the square cow. Um, this is inspired by a biotechnology topic. But in that case, maybe Dali was also uh, using a biothematic because he was uh, alive when it was the discover of the DNA and, and he was making paint, paintings uh, about the DNA, making some uh, funny words like galaxy, the exocytogonucleic acid, combining the DNA name with the name of Gala, her, his partner. Um, but for me, this enter in the biothematic, but not as a bio art. Then what for, for me and most commonly is interpreted as bio art, that the artworks are use biomedia. Um, the first artwork that was presented in a gallery, that it was a living system, was in 19, 1936. So it's not so new, as you can see. And it was uh, delphiniums, these plants, that was presented by Edward Station in the MoMA Museum. But well, of course, MoMA was not the institute that we know nowadays. It only had seven years open. So they had like a gap of a week that there was nothing to exhibit there. And Edward was working as a photographer in the gallery. So he said like, hey, I have some delphiniums that I have been culturing in order to express different colors and a specific type of hate. Um, and this was not genetically modified. It was just inbreeding, like when you select one plant and another and you uh, make them mate in order to have the similar characteristics in the offspring. Uh, but then we can also find uh, some paintings of bacteria. So I want to ask, do you know who, who was Fleming? Does this last name recall something for you? Fleming was a scientist. Uh, he was invented penicillin, if I'm correct. Yes, you are correct. Yes, uh, Fleming was a discovered of penicillin, the antibiotic. And then he changed our life because we were dying very young and now we <laughs> have much more treatments and life expectancy increased. And he was also painting with the bacteria. So Fleming as many scientists get obsessed with their work. 
So he was working in his house, uh, ha having a lot of fungi, a lot of bacteria in the, um, in the table. And then his, his wife came and said like, you need to eat something, please at least eat this orange. But he of course forgot, he was drawing, he was making visualizations in the microscope. He forgot about the orange and leave it in the table. A few days later, he saw that the orange had uh, like blue fungi, fungi growing, but bacteria was not growing nearby. So he was surprised, like why is this fungi uh, killing or why the bacteria is not growing near this, this organism? And he started to study it and discover that this penicillium, uh, the fungi had a, a prot uh, molecule that could kill bacteria. And that's how the first antibiotic was discovered. So he also made these paintings. Uh, you can see like a mother with a baby. I, I understand that these are like some viruses, I don't know, like playing or, or uh, it looks like a virus dad and a virus kid, I'm not so sure. However, these type of um, paintings are not considered as part of contemporary art because there is not a concept or narrative behind. So it's not considered as bio art, but we can track back to 1928. The first person was a scientist to paint with bacteria. So have you ever heard or seen this artwork from Heather Dewey Harburg, Stranger Visions? Does anyone have seen it? No? Okay, then imagine that you enter to a gallery and you see a 3D printed image that looks just like yourself. So what she did, she 3D printed uh, faces of people that she had never seen. And how she did that? Well, she collected DNA from different parts of the street. Uh, she was in the therapist and she found in the sofa where she was waiting the hair of another person. It was a blonde hair. And she started to wonder, like, who was this person that was here before me? What are the problems that this person had? It was a man, it was a woman. So he, uh, she started to think um, the story behind this hair and then realized that she had the DNA of, of another person. So, uh, she took different samples from hairs, from uh, the, the breast of cigarettes. Every time you take something into your mouth or like, I don't know, straw and you throw it away, there are small particles of DNA of, of your cells. And then she multiplied the DNA to have a big amount and analyze it. Uh, there is, open database of DNA. And you can compare the genes of your unknown sample from the street to the database online and make a prediction of more or less how these people can look like. Of course, it's uh, a bit speculative because you cannot really predict uh, how a person looks like just by the DNA. Last century, without the DNA, the termin of life because we discovered the genes and we thought like, if you have a gene for some disease, you will have this disease or something like this. But nowadays uh, we know that that's not true. Uh, who you are is 70% uh, depending of the habits that you have. Then it's 20% depending of the environment and it's only 10% depending of your DNA. So your DNA is not determining, uh, determining who you are. Uh, for example, you can have the gene for a specific disease or a specific failure in, uh, I don't know, in the cells, in the red cells of your blood, but it might never be expressed. Uh, it will be silenced maybe all your life because you have a healthy uh, style of life, or maybe if you don't have a healthy style of life, you will trigger this type of, of um, disease. Okay, so we have another uh, recommendation from Hussein. Uh, we save the links and you can check the, the projects. So it's using neural networks. Uh, Hussein, would you like to, to, to show or to tell us a little bit about the project? 
this site is using artificial intelligence to um, and uh, the is uh, uh, each time you refresh the page, it would generate another person's uh, picture that doesn't exist in the world. True. Yeah, I remember also this, this neural network. So the persons that we're watching now, they do not exist. They are just generated by a neural network. They are so accurate. You, you cannot really distinguish that they are not real. Yeah, they have a very large database of human pictures, so they can generate a lot of uh, pictures like them. Yeah. This is also, I see another one also from the same uh, group of scientists uh, of cats. So you can also see a cat that never existed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Mm, good. So uh, I want to make a difference here and recommend you this very short but very nice, um, uh, sorry, report of uh, Jane Hauser is called Biomediality and Art, Recomposing Art and Science. And in this paper, he made the difference or classification between biological media, media of biology and biomedia. So biological media will be uh, everything that is related to be alive. For example, it can be the temperature, the water, humidity. Um, it can be also uh, as an organism like bacteria or like a uh, plant. But when you are making artworks with it, they don't change the person. The, um, the, there is no difference in, in a plant in the forest and a plant in the gallery. So the plant is still the plant. And what is different with biomedia is that you can use the plant or the or, or in your artwork you are playing with the water, humidity, but it's changing something. For example, when you have a transgenic plant, it's not already biological media. If your plant is glowing because you put a gene of a jellyfish that is glowing, then it becomes biomedia. When your biological media is not doing, is doing something different and the perception of it is different, then it becomes biomedia. And then it's also media of biology when you are using the instruments, for example, when you use a technology to visualize DNA or to isolate proteins in your artwork, then you are using media of biology. What we know as bioart usually use biomedia. When you take something from nature and change the initial function, so it represents something else. Uh, in that case, then bioart can be described as a biomediality. Uh, I put here a phrase of Donna Haraway that is uh, one of the most important influencers, uh, well, let's say like philosophers in, in the bio art, <laughs> not influencer, philosopher. And she, uh, I put this, this phrase because it, the very first sentence, like it matters what matters we used to think about other matters with. So in bio art, it's not about just to take something uh, technological or trendy. And I want to use cells to create an artwork about um, the origin of life. You need to really think if it is necessary to use a living system to express the meshes that you want to say. Because sometimes it's not necessary and there is a hype right now that everyone wants to use something alive or, or some plants or some animals. But uh, it's not just about using them, it's about collaborating with them. So every time that you will integrate a material or a living system, it's already changing the whole message of your artwork or your piece. Uh, and this also is related with the idea of McLuhan that says the medium is the message. But I think in bio art, it's not only like the medium or what you're using, but is the growth of the medium. What in, in what will give uh, a different meaning of your artwork. So um, 
I want to make just a very brief like type lecture of biology because maybe uh, not all of us know uh, what is DNA or how it works. So uh, because I will use, I will show some artworks that talk about DNA. I want to everyone stay in the same road. So in your in your cells, you have a lot of cells in your body. You have this molecule called DNA, and it's made of these nitrogen bases, nucleobases of DNA, like thymine, cytosine, adenine, one. Here are represented by the colors. So they are double strands and they come together to make this double helix. So they pair each other, like thymine pair with adenine and cytosine pair with one. And usually we know it like T, C, A, and J. G, sorry. <laughs> Uh, then uh, the DNA is, we, for the study, we have divided into genes. For example, from this part to this part, it might be one gene. And this gene uh, will the, say the instructions to make the color of your eyes. Usually it's not only one gene, it will be like seven genes to, to one characteristic of your body that is called phenotype. Um, but how that works, so in your DNA, you have this gene and it will be, uh, will be open, the double helix will open and there will be a copy of this gene, but in another very similar molecule called RNA. And from this RNA, the instructions will be translated into a protein. And this protein is the one that will give the color of your eyes, or this protein is the one that is helping you to decompose the food that you eat, or the protein is taking oxygen from your lungs into your cells. So basically, all of what you are is a lot of proteins. A lot of proteins making tissues, proteins making your organs, proteins making reactions. So the DNA itself actually doesn't do too much. The DNA are the instructions. Then imagine that it's a different language. And then we translate it in a language that we know. And then we have all the workers actually doing something. So uh, the proteins are making your, your muscles. The proteins are making your eyes. And now I have a question. I told you that in your cells, you have the same DNA in all your cells. So why your cell from the eye looks different from your cells from the skin if you have the same DNA? Can you imagine? I guess the arrangement of the DNA, it makes like it's the, the same idea of coding. When you are making coding uh, for something, it, it creates different, uh, let's say it's like a piano. When you uh, play a different set of the piano, it makes a different uh, music. So I guess it's the same idea. Yeah, that's an awesome analogy. I think I will steal it from you if you, <laughs> if you allow me. It's my pleasure, sure. <laughs> Thank you, yes. So imagine that this is a piano and according of the genes that are expressed or according to the, the, um, the melody that you will play, it will express the proteins to make your skin cell or to make your eye cell. So in theory, it's possible that you take a cell from your eye and convert it into a cell of your skin. So you could reverse the process because you have the same DNA. So just play another melody. Okay, uh, so I told you that bio is from the very uh, small parts of DNA into the universe ecosystem, passing for, from all the small entities from bacteria, viruses, to animals and plants. So, do you know this artwork? Uh, 
Has anyone seen this artwork? It's called Micro Venus from Joe Davis. So uh, what you can see here is a picture. And this artwork was the first synthetic DNA that uh, was created to represent a picture. So you have here, this is a rune, uh, a Germanic rune representing the female earth or femininity. And then they translated first into binary code. So you can still see here in the ones, the image. And then they assigned uh, to the number one, for example, they assigned one of these bases, for example, T-min or cytosine. So for example, let's say like T-min will be one and then adenine will be uh, zeros. So you will have T-min, uh, adenine, T-min, adenine, and so on. And then you will form the DNA. Of course, it was not just two single pairs. There were much more uh, bases of DNA. But this is a way that you can transfer something that is uh, a picture into DNA information. If we could um, save all the internet information that exists in the world right now, we need less than one milligram of bacteria to save all the information into DNA. So DNA is one of the most powerful uh, devices for storage of information. And what they did is to create the picture into DNA and then send it to the space. And why send it to the space? Well, first, why not? But the uh, idea was that it was a reactive artwork to this pioneer table that was sent, that was sent sorry, uh, to the space a few years uh, before. It was a project of NASA and Carl Sagan, uh, where Carl Sagan put in the spacecraft Pioneer 10 or 11, I don't remember, um, sent this table in case the spacecraft finds some intelligent life in the space. And it will be like, hey, we came from here. Uh, you see in the bottom part, there is a representation of the solar system. So it's like, hey, we came from this planet and we look like this and we are tall like this. And these are the most common chemical bonds in our earth. And we have two types of specimens, a male specimen and a female specimen. And so this was mostly a scientific project. I, and you can see that the, fem the male genitalia is quite well, I would say, is represented, but the female genitalia is not accurately represented. So what John Davis did is like send a few later, years later, say like, hey, we forgot this part actually. So this is uh, a response for the missing part of the genitalia of the woman in a scientific project uh, created by an answer of an artistic project. So this is the uh, Germanic rune that was represented as the genitalia that, we, that the scientists forgot to send to the space. Joe Davis also sent some uh, vaginal con con contractions into the space. He was the first artist in the 1980s to send piece of arts into the space. Then we have Eduardo Katz. And it's also a pioneer of bio art. And I just told you that we can storage information into bacteria, into DNA. And this DNA can be inside of bacteria. So what he did, he storage an information. Uh, this is the DNA code. And he put this DNA code into a bacteria called E. coli. But what does this DNA code mean? Well, uh, it has uh, the base in the Gen Genesis text from the Bible. That's why the artwork is called Genesis. And it's the first phrase, like, let men have the mind over the fish of the sea and over the bow. Then he converted the alphabetic text into a Morse code 
with dots and lines, and then assign to each dot uh, a specific DNA um, nit nitrogen base, for example, cytosine, timine, adenine, guanine, and inserted this DNA inside of a bacteria. Metabacteria, they are alive, so they reproduce each uh, reproduce and have uh, offspring and a characteristic of life is to have mutations. If something cannot mutate, it cannot be considered a life. Uh, NASA, uh, NASA is trying to find life outside of Earth, right? So they, if they are trying to find life, they should have a definition of what life is. So they say that to be considered a life, it should be an uh, autonomous system, so it shouldn't depend on any other organism. It should be able to reproduce itself and have mutations. In that case, it can be maybe some algorithm in some moment can, can be considered as a life. However, the algorithm still is dependent of some other technology sometimes or, 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 or the coder, for example. So the bacteria start to reproduce and start to mutate. So uh, when they took back the DNA, translated back into code mores and then again into alphabet, they saw some mutations. Instead of men, then it changed to on. Uh, we have another mutations here. And what is important about this artwork, it was in the 91. And Eduardo Katz said that he created an artistic gene because the artistic, the, the final artwork, it was not in the um, hands of the artists anymore. It, depending, it depended on what the gene, in the gene mutation. So it was a collaboration with a gene. And in that case, um, we start to see a bacteria or even something smaller like the DNA as a subject, something that changed by its own. And that, I think, is one of the main characteristics of uh, bioart. Do you know this project? What do you see here in the image? I think it's bio, some object, bio object like bacteria. Is okay. it yeah. clothes? So it looks like a piece of clothes, right? Yeah. What else do you see? What, what type of clothes? Is it like biofabricated jumper? A jumper? Yeah. <laughs> Looks like a dress also. Looks like a skin. It looks like a skin. Yeah. So all of you are in, in the right way. So this is a project from the group Tissue Culture an art project made by Oron Katz and Yonat Sur, and it's called Victimless Leather. So they had a living uh, pig, and they just took a sample from the skin of the pig and grow this sample of the skin in the laboratory uh, in a skull fold or a structure of bone that resemble a jacket. So this is uh, an artwork making a statement of the use of other animals just for aesthetics and protections of humans. For example, when you use leather, we kill hundreds uh, or millions of, of animals in order to produce leather. But in this case, they produce a jacket of leather without killing any animal. Uh, and this artwork was in 2004 was presented uh, for first time in Australia. And something that was very interesting about the artwork beyond already the statement itself is that during the exhibition, it was connected uh, to all the nutrients necessary to grow cells or to keep it alive. Um, there was oxygen, there was the, uh, carbon dioxide, uh, nutrients to, to grow the cells. And during the exhibition, it was growing. So it will look different if you went to the gallery the first day or if you 
go there in the seventh day. And then when the exhibition finalized, they had it to disconnect it. And it was, uh, they even made like a performance of it because this is a life. And if you disconnect it when the gallery, the exhibition finished, then you are killing something. And this raises questions about what is, what means to be alive and what are the human uh, responsibilities when we are working with something as a cell or a culture of cell, like, can we really kill it? Is, are, are we in, in the right of, of kill? What do you think about this? Do you think they, they kill something? A lot of people was uh, defending the jacket somehow, like it should remain alive. So they they give some kind of personhood because they saw it growing. And, and they, this also make um, some statements about uh, what can be considered as alive, for example, a fetus or when, when is considered something alive when how many cells or what it means of course the jacket do not have a nervous system so it couldn't feel anything and it was quite of a uh, polemic however let me tell you that in this laboratory we kill every day hundreds and millions of cells and bacteria and tissues and can be human cells and nobody says anything to a scientist killing human cells but if you are an artist, you might face this type of, of a statement. But I think that is one of the beautiful things to bring from the laboratory walls into the society, this type of practice. Another um, project of Oron and Sur is made with similar technology that actually they, uh, they are artists, but they patent this scientific protocol to grow uh, tissues. And they have received a lot of offers to buy this protocol for companies that they want to make artificial meat or they want to make artificial leather uh, in a big scale. Um, they are very interested in this. However, uh, to grow these cells, you, can, uh, you still need to use nutrients. Uh, and this nutrients is called media. And the media came from baby calves. Uh, they, they take calves and triturate them and take the, the um, nutrients from the media that they were living. So it's still not victimless, victimless leather. So still to grow cells, you kill other type of organisms. Uh, they create these ones that are the semi-living worry dolls. Uh, they have the origin in a Latin American uh, doll, uh, this type of little dolls. Uh, you can buy them and they, they are supposed uh, to help you if you have some concern or worry. You can tell to them in the night, like, oh, I'm very worried because I have uh, an exam tomorrow, I'm presenting my thesis. Then you put it under your pillow and the, the myth say that this little doll will help you to, to solve your concerns. So Oron decide to make a real living doll with cells inspired by this one. I think here in Russia, we have something similar uh, like this one. Uh, I bought this one that was supposed to help me to travel, but then there was pandemia, so it really didn't help too much. Uh, I couldn't travel for more than two years. Uh, okay, and now let's go to something more uh, contemporary. Have you ever heard about labor from Paul Banus? Can anyone tell me something about it? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Paul Banus in nine. Uh, in I think this project won like. Yeah, one, what, sorry? Carrie, oh, you were I said something? like uh, this project would, yeah, yeah. I think this project like won the golden uh, era of like the uh, arts uh, electronica for like uh, that that year, right? And it's yep. like using like uh, people's like uh, 
uh, like people's tissues or something like that uh, from like the the factory or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, true. Uh, so it won the golden. I'm, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. It's golden Nika or golden Nike uh, uh, from Ars Electronica, or maybe it's another pronunciation. Uh, but it's the award that the artist received in Ars Electronica. And um, what Paul Panos did, he collected uh, bacteria from the skin of different persons working in slavery conditions. That's why the project made the question, how does exploitation or slavery smell like? Uh, so you have a lot of bacteria right now in your body, in your skin, inside your guts. You are like one bacteria from one human cells in your body. And this bacteria can interact with your own biochemistry. There is new studies that say that the bacteria inside your guts, the biochemistry can interfere in the biochemistry in, of your brain. And for example, give you some traits to be more extrovert or to be more introvert, uh, try to be, uh, to have tendencies to depression or not traits to um, get overweight or not. So people now is changing the bacteria inside their body to change also how they look like or, or their behavior. That's very interesting topic in the last five years. Uh, and also your smell, how do you smell, how you smell and how other people smell like depends on the bacteria that lives in your body. Sometimes when you move to another country, your smell change because now there is different weather and you have different bacteria. And uh, so he asked the question, why, how people working in slavery smell like? So he collected samples from people skin and grow them in a Petri dish with a lot of media and identify what was the most common bacteria that make it smell. And he found three, Staphylococcus epidermis, uh, Corinobacterium serosis, Propinobacterium avi. And then he, put these bacteria in bioreactors to keep them alive. And they were, oh, they were connected uh, by different um, tubes into a never used t-shirt. And this t-shirt was being impregnated by the smell of the bacteria, but in, in the philosophical statement is being impregnated by the smell of slavery. Um, I would like to know so far, what do you think about this artwork? You like it, you don't like it. Actually, I see it, it's very interesting because there is a collaboration between, uh, between the biosystems and the human art craft. So this collaboration, it makes something creative and interesting and it might be that create different results in the future. I'm not sure, but yeah, uh, for me, it's 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 my spot that I would like to see it always. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anyone else have an opinion? For me, it's interesting the idea also that he's exploiting, exploding bacteria to create this artwork. I mean, he's talking about the slavery, uh, slavery of human, for example, but he's also using uh, the bacteria and exploding in, uh, to create the artwork itself. So it's like, a, I, I think it's a multi-layer artwork. That's why it was, um, awarded and, and you can see how uh, people is trying to smell the slavery or the, the, the bacteria produce the smell. Uh, there was a small holes um, in, near the t-shirt. The uh, so people was trying to, to get the aroma. And I want to mention something very important. You can see, um, sorry, you can see in the bottom of the um, t-shirt, there are some bottles. This is the, the media that has nutrients to make the growth of the bacteria. And this media like in the laboratory or the one that he used, it actually looks like a very strong 
tea or a very awful uh, coffee. So it's just like dirty water. It, it's not beautiful. Uh, however, uh, in this artwork, you can see the bioreactors with the orange light. They look very elegant. So it's like techno elegance. That is very important when you are working in bioart because usually bioart can look not so aesthetic uh, for, for the human appealing. If you just put the bubbling uh, media uh, that looks like dirty water, it might not look as interesting and beautiful uh, as this uh, installation looks like. So it was really impressive when you entered to the room. There was like this uh, almost radioactive orange uh, bioreactors. So it's just like how well executed was this project. I'm not sure if it was uh, the only the intervention of the artist or if the curator of, of the installation also had something to do there, but uh, for, for anyone interested in bio art, it should be important. And then we have also um, an artist from Mexico, Gilberto Esparza. Gilberto Esparza, uh, he is very interested in autonomous systems. He's creating um, autonomous entities, mostly um, with uh, robotic, uh, robotics devi de devices based in robotics. And uh, this one is um, auto, -pho auto photosynthetic plants. Um, and basically what you see here are columns that have bacteria. The bacteria is eating food, uh, is eating uh, small proteins, and all the bacteria that lives in these columns generates electricity. Is when you go to some pond or in a river, the bacteria that lives uh, in the mud uh, can create a difference of uh, of um, current current sorry, and that difference can give you electricity. So when the bacteria is eating here, there are some electrodes that um, collect the difference in the current and create electricity that turns on some light and also make some sounds. So the light um, is directed to the nucleus that is made of water and algae. And when the light is on, the algae can make the photosynthesis and survive, and then um, is growing here. When the bacteria finish all the food, there is no more light. So this system realizes that there is no more light. It cannot make more photosynthesis. So it delivers some part of the biomass of the algae to the columns, so the bacteria can get more food. So it's a full cycle. There is more food, they create electricity, there is light, so there is photosynthesis. When the food ends, more food comes. And this is autonomous eco ecosystem presented in the gallery. It can survive without human interaction uh, until it can be disconnected or, um, but it, it will still make the reaction even when it's not in the gallery. So this is like an autonomous installation. Uh, then in the genetics of plants, uh, talking about personhood and how to transpolate personhood into a bacteria or into a plant, we have, um, sorry, we have Adam Saretsky that he modified a, a flower that is called, a plant, sorry, called Arabidopsis thaliana. Uh, and he modified it with the idea to make a bipolar flower. So bipolarity in a psychiatric um, field, very broadly or, or rough, I will describe, uh, it's characterized by the ups uh, and downs in, in different behaviors that have the base in the biochemistry of, of, of our brain. So basically he altered the genome of a plant to express suddenly more proteins, but when the proteins was expressed, trigger another mechanism to suppress these proteins. So it was two genes that were fighting each other 
to express protein or to suppress protein. And then when it was suppressed protein, the other gene was like, oh, we need to produce more. And it was an eternal fight of producing more proteins or decreasing proteins. And here we have one normal, well, not normal, let's say a uh, common uh, or wild uh, Arabidopsis taliana and another that is the bipolar Arabidopsis. Which one do you think is the bipolar? The right one? Sorry, the left one or the right one? The right one? The right one. I, sorry. You think this is a bipolar? Yes. Yes, it's bigger. <laughs> <laughs> right, you are? This is a bipolar flower. Um, it, it also means like how they're like for, for the artists, it's like how to rethink the different behavioral patterns. Uh, I call it behave, different behavioral patterns instead of syndromes or mental disease. It means to, to rethink that we, the, the normality that we know as normality is actually a normal. Um, because the normality is to have mutations, is to be different. Without that, we we wouldn't survive. Um, so he is rethinking about uh, mental different behavioral patterns expressed in another entities like plants. And he couldn't present this uh, in any gallery in the USA at the moment because uh, this is a genetic modified organism. Although it's not genetic with another uh, type of genes from, I don't know, from a bear or a fish. No, it's just the same DNA of the plant expressed differently, more and less. However, they couldn't present it in the gallery, so he just made um, uh, a performance. Uh, oh, I think you don't hear the sound, right? Yeah, let, let, I will start to share again. Um, so because I forgot to share the sound, uh, share computer sound. And I just wanted to, to show this uh, video because uh, Saretsky and collaborators are very eccentric, but they are also very good scientists. And it's also how scientists collaborating with artists are having fun uh, going outside the, the seriousness sometimes. Do you hear sound? Basically, he brought the plants into a chamber that he created like as a concert for plants. So the whole um, the, the whole performance was how to transfer these plants to receive a concert from the machine that he created. So we saw uh, we saw DNA, bacteria. Uh, then we went into cells, tissues, plants. Now let's go to the body. Uh, we are also alive, we are bio. And as a bio artist, you can also interact with your own body. So Marta de Meneses is a pioneer in the area of bio art. And one of her recent projects is called Anti Marta. Uh, you can see that she has these two scars where she took tissue uh, from, from her own body, the skin. Um, in the 40s in America, uh, the scientists were understanding how to transplant tissue. So nowadays it's a very common uh, medical procedure. If someone gets some burn, for example, they take skin from, from another part like the leg and they can put into the, the area that was burned in, in your body. But in the 40s, they were making experiments and one of the most common experiments was just to cut your own skin 
in two parts and bring this part here and the other part in the top. And they will see that there will be again um, uh, like a, an absorption absorption of your own skin because it recognizes your own skin. If you put a piece of the skin of someone else, it will be rejected because you have a, an immune system that it recognizes DNA that is not yours and attack it in order to protect you from bacteria and viruses. So what Marta did, uh, it was a performance with her husband. Her husband is Luis Garza, and he is a scientist uh, uh, in biomedicine. And they have been together, I think, around 20 years or something like this. And they have been also working together. Uh, so uh, the project of Anti Marta uh, is uh, a performance between the two of them. Because she, she expressed it like sometimes when you are too much time or when you are a lot of time together, you become kind of in a symbiosis. And sometimes you acquire too much of your couple or your partner. Sometimes you need to redefine again who you are. So um, Marta decided to create this performance with him to recover her own identity, for example, exchanging some very intimate part of herself with her husband. Um, so what they did, uh, they both of them took uh, these parts of the skin and Marta's skin come to the second part down, but the second part came into the arm of her husband. And the same, so one part of her husband came into the top. So she had one of her own skin and one uh, part of the skin of her husband. Her own skin will be absorbed again, but the skin of her husband will be rejected and fall in a few uh, weeks later. So this was an exchange of skin, uh, something very intimate and sensitive, but also it was a statement of uh, how when we are together, we're still single individuals. And uh, it was a, a statement of redefining who we are, although we are together, we're not the same. So I reject uh, some part of, of, of you in order to maintain my, my identity, but we are still in a symbiosis uh, together as a couple or as performers or as an artist and scientist, both of us. Uh, for me, this is one of the most romantic artworks that I have seen in the last years. And I was very impressed and how they presented. Well, they were there in the gallery uh, and you could see the scars, but also uh, they had projectors in the, in the roof and a table. So you could sit in front of another person and you put your hand and there was a projector like kind of 3D mapping uh, where the, the video was the surgery that they perform. So you put your hand and it looks like the surgeon and the doctor was making this in your skin and in the person in front of you. So you were sharing skin with different persons that you never met in, in the gallery. And I think it was very strong artwork, biologically talking and, and also philosophically. Then um, we have uh, Annie Liu with Mind Controller Spermatozo. Uh, basically, I will share to you some video. Let me know if you hear the sound, please. Um, um, yes, you hear? Okay.
Okay. Um, just a, a reminder, I will send you the presentation and you will be able later to, to look at the full videos. Um, so what you saw, it was uh, Annie Liu had this EGG collector of the brain waves, and she was training in order to uh, direct her thoughts um, in certain way that it will activate, uh, sorry, an electric sensor, uh, no, sorry, uh, an, an electric um, field in different parts of the petri dish where the spermatozoids were present. And when she was activating this part, the electricity will make that the spermatozoids move. I actually don't remember if they go uh, against the electric current or towards the electric current. Uh, but she can activate four different uh, electric points and move the spermatozoids to different directions. So this artwork is using biomedia. So the spermatozoid is like doing something that usually you shouldn't do or wouldn't do in, in the normal state, or the most common state of the spermatozoid. But it's also using technology. So it's like a combination of bio art and technological art. Uh, but the, this, the statement is considered mostly as bio art. Then we also have another type of collaborations with insects. For example, we have the caddis fly larvae that in nature, they take different stones or rocks in their environment to create their cocoon. Uh, then they have a metamorphosis and leave the cocoon. So the artist, uh, Hubert Duprant, he took these larvae and instead of putting an environment with rocks, the environment was made of golds and pearls. So the, um, the larvae started to build these beautiful cocoons that are very expensive and was, they were sold as artworks in collaboration with another uh, species. Okay, so you probably know, all of, all of you know maybe this artwork from Eduardo Katz. Do you know Alba? Yes, great. Uh, so she was a bunny and she her DNA was modified with the gene of a jellyfish to make it glow. Actually, they, we don't have pictures of Alba. We only have this one and this one with Eduardo. So. As a scientist, I could say that this is almost impossible to achieve. Uh, I mean, you can make for sure an organism like, like animal probably glow, but not in this way. Like you can see that even the eyes are glowing. There should be some different, um, different shadows of the glowing in an organism. So uh, the idea is that this artwork is, uh, wait, sorry. Ah. Sorry, it's fake, but I mean, it's a speculative, but it has never been disclaimed by the artist yet. Uh, I really don't care if it is really fake because Eduardo already put it in our mind. And I think this is the artwork itself that we believe, or there was the idea that a bunny is glowing. Uh, in the laboratory, scientists are modifying rats and mice and bunnies and different organisms all the time. But this was the first organism that was created for aesthetic reasons. And the statement was about the responsibility we have. Like, so what's gonna happen with the bunny now? Uh, can be exhibited, but it's alive, it's not an object. Uh, what is the responsibility of the artist when he's working with something alive? Uh, people was a bit scared some, uh, of Alva. Some people thought that she was a monster uh, or it was a monster. Sorry, I have this, um, let's say like a trait that I say, I talk about animals and things in English, like he or she. Um, I think that in the beginning was because in Spanish, uh, we don't have like it, we usually talk about so like her or, or she. However, more I went into post-humanism, I also like to talk about other organisms as he or she, but um, uh, in general in English will be it. So uh, people thought that Alva, uh, it was a, a monster and was afraid of it. Like it's unnatural, uh, it shouldn't be right. What do you think? Does it look cute or is an anomaly? Anomaly? 
Well, Alain and Tommy. Okay. <laughs> I think <laughs> <laughs> no problem, just glowing rabbit. <laughs> glowing rabbit. <laughs> nice, yes. I mean, I wonder I guess... can, it, can it survive in like in our environment with different species? Uh, I think most probably yes, they can survive. Um, so the mice modify with GFP, the green fluorescent protein, they can usually survive have a normal life. However, they are modified mostly because we induce some tumors, for example. So we try to study cancer on them. So that's why they usually don't live, don't live, sorry. But if there is only green fluorescent protein, yeah, they can have, a, let's say normal, <laughs> like <laughs> so some people was very scared anyway about Alva uh, because he was a glow, uh, glowing but I like how Eduardo uh, approached these critiques he makes this experiment in his lectures when asked the public to to put their hands together or their skin uh, uh, like one centimeter far far and if you do this, you will start to feel a bit of warm in your skin. Like even when you are not touching it, you feel the warm. And this warm is part of your temperature, but also is infrared light. The human eye the, uh, does not see um, infrared. We have a very limited uh, vision of the light spectrum. But other animals like reptiles and some bats, they can see infrared. Um, and then for, for these other species, we are also glowing monsters. And this is the idea of how, when we're working with bioart, we need to change a bit the perspective. Uh, maybe the anthropocentric perspective is quite, is being destroyed quite often by the bioart artworks when the glowing monster is not the bunny, but it can be also the human. Just, we cannot see it, uh, but other species can see us glowing. And it also is a good reminder, and sometimes you are quite sad, sad or depressed or something, just look at yourself in the mirror and remember that you are glowing and everything is awesome. So um, this is the idea of how to work with animals and with other species in bio art. And then, so in the beginning, I asked you about bio art and you told me about inspiration. You told me also about manipulation. What do you think is the difference with bio design and bio art? Or what is bio design for you? Uh, design is more focused on human needs. So maybe mm -hmm. it is more practical than just bio art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, I, I also agree with uh, everything that you just said. Um, however, sometimes bio design also applies as bio art because it's so well produced and it's changing the perspective so much uh, of the material that you use that it becomes an art. But a very good way to redefine if it is bio design or bio art could be the um, uh, final um, function of the object. Uh, however, sometimes it's very difficult. Sometimes it's the same, bio design and bio art. Especially if you're talking about the speculative bio art, you can design something speculative and it can enter as an artwork, but also as a speculative design. So um, uh, I personally see a lot of intersection between all of them. Uh, however, uh, the function and some of the way of how to, to work with the material make the difference. In biodesign, a uh, strategy is biomimetic. Um, and mimesis means imitation. So basically you get inspired not only by the forms uh, of the nature, but also of the processes of how they communicate. So you can get inspired on how a plant communicates uh, with fungi uh, living in the roots in order to create a network of Wi-Fi, for example. 
And in this case, biomimetics uh, was, is defined as the imitation of models. And uh, as Nastia said, uh, to solve or some uh, human, uh, let's say, uh, problems or, or, or to give some improvement for the products. So looking at nature to find new architectural answer is no longer just a matter of originality, but it's also about the responsibility for protecting the environment. So a lot of you are uh, working with architecture, right? Um, so I think you, you also have, find, have found that uh, nowadays it's not about the aesthetics, but also the impact of the uh, design and architecture into the community, into the environment, into the whole ecosystem. Uh, do you know the story about the bullet train in Japan? Does anyone recall? No, something that you can share? Yes, no? Let me see your faces. No? Okay. <laughs> so uh, I have a uh, chat. Yes, Kira, uh, and could you say something about it? Hello, I didn't see this train in particular, but I think it's similar to Maglev in uh, China. Well, quite similar. It's like a very high speed train with a speed equivalent to uh, um, uh, to a flight on a plane, something like this. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'm quite interested in this type of uh, um, machinery, so yeah. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, for sure, this is a very high speed train. And the problem when it was designed is that these high speed trains uh, move the air so fast and so much, so it makes a lot of vibration and they were super noisy. Noisy for the people that live around the train tra road um, to, uh, or next to the pathway where the train was passing and very noisy for the people inside of the train. Uh, so it was not comfortable, this type of design in the very beginning. And they made a team of hundreds of engineers and designers uh, in order to solve the problem and say like, how we can make that the train is not noisy because it's not working. It's super fast and it's a like great technology, but nobody's gonna use it. And they have a secret weapon um, the secret weapon was that the leader of the engineer team was a bird watcher. And he was fascinated by birds and realized that uh, when the kingfisher bird was trying to take fishes from the lake, for example, it didn't make waves in the water. So the beak of the bird do not disturb the environment around. And water make waves and air moves as waves. So they design the uh, train um, facade as the Kingfisher beak. And that decrease a lot the noise and the vibration of the air. So now the train could be uh, possible to use without so much noise. And not only that, they also uh, create some pantographs and as the, the, um, the devices that were getting together the wagons or the, the cars of the train, inspired by different uh, wings of, for example, the owl, in order to not that or in order that this type of device do not interfere with the speed and it could continue with the maximum speed of, of the train. Uh, biomimetic can also apply not only in engineering, but in bio, in, in medicine. For example, the shark skin, uh, uh, the bacteria do not attach into this uh, type of skin that is made by different cells. Uh, so this form a structure was inspired to create antibacterial materials uh, that are used in the surgeries, for example. Uh, so in the hospitals, it's very important to not have communities of bacteria that can infect uh, other patients or the bodies. So they are creating these antibacterial plastics. I will send you also the, 
a very nice paper about uh, biodesign, where you can see a lot of different examples of how the, the skin um, are the skin of different type of animals or human skin or leaves um, are inspiring different products to for water collection or to oil separation. Uh, fluid circulation. Uh, this, for example, I will tell you about how the spinach leaf is being inspiration to create cardiac tissue because it has a lot of venations, like our heart has a lot of veins. So you can get inspired by structure, but the way the, the materials use energy by the color, by the sound of these uh, type of materials, by movement. Um, and in general, it's not only the shape, but also the way to make process or how to interact with the ecosystems. Okay, so in bioarchitecture, uh, uh, as I told in the very beginning uh, of this part, uh, is not only about the construction, but it's also about the, di the dimension and the effect of, the, of what you are designing. So you probably know how the bird's nest um, stadium was inspired by a bird nest. And then we also have for Barcelona, another type of bio inspiration in La Sagrada Familia. When you enter and you look up, you will feel like in, a, in the middle of the forest. So all the columns are inspired by the trunks and the different trees. So it's not only one single column, but it's divided like branches of the tree. Uh, so it's imagine like a forest made of concrete. And for sure, if you go to La Sagrada Familia, you will understand like the ultimate meaning of bio, bio design inspired when uh, turtles are supporting columns or different birds in the facades with a lot of different um, references to nature. Uh, however, uh, not all of them is uh, bio design. In this case, the columns especially, because it's a new way to make columns to support the huge uh, roof that was created for this uh, church or, or for this building. Um, because they have each of them three or four branches and they also have a, they have a turning in the, in the end of, of the columns that go into the floor. So it's, it's a very interesting um, type of columns to analyze in the current architecture. And then uh, it's not only architecture inspired by materials, but it's also architecture made by organic materials. In, in this case, we have the growing pavilion that it was presented also as an artwork, but it's also part of biodesign that is a building in Netherlands made of mushrooms. It cleans the air uh, as is, it needs air to grow and it's also cleaning the, the air meanwhile it's growing. It's produ produced, it was produced by New Heroes and Biotechnology Company um, uh, known as Bio, sorry, the, known as New Heroes, that is a biotechnology company and is a bio-based building. So you can still visit this type of architecture. Mm -hmm. And you can see the mushrooms growing around. Have you ever entered of a building made of mushrooms or some other material? Not someone? Because I haven't. I will be very curious. A little bit afraid also. <laughs> okay. So another type of... Um, Organic architecture is a bamboo theater. Uh, this in the um, uh, designed by Cooper Hewitt, and uh, basically they modulate the growing of different bamboos in order to create this structure. And it's also a uh, organic based uh, building that you can still visit. And then I want to mention something here in in Mexico. Um, when the 
architecture cross uh, architectural process is finished by the nature or by by the uh, animals and plants around so in in the north of mexico in a place called Gilitla, there is this surrealistic castle now known as surrealistic castle that it was made by edward james edward james was part of the family of forbes but let's let's say that he was like the black sheep of the Forbes family and he moved to mexico uh, and with the money that he could got uh, before leaving his, the, the, his family, uh, he started to create uh, these structures, uh, but he left unfinished most of the art of the buildings, allowing nature to finish the connections between all the buildings. So now, when you go there, the columns are created by some plants native of Mexico. Um, now it's a very touristic place, uh, but it still is considered as organic architecture. When, nat when human gives uh, the right to nature to finish the product. Um, another type of biodesign is when we are using the organisms to create new bodies, to create new materials, and it's also known as moist media. Uh, when you use, for example, fungi, algae, yeast, uh, or even tissue. So in this case, it's also difficult to distinguish if the victim's jacket, that it really looks like a jacket, can be considered biodesign or not, because it was a tissue culture designed, but it was presented also in, in the, as an artwork. And this chair, for example, this, um, uh, I forgot the, the name, it's not a chair, but when it doesn't have to put your back. Well, okay, like this type of um, place where you can sit. Uh, it can be presented as an artwork with some of, of these type of um, design furniture was presented in, in Pompidou two years ago, but they are also presented as a product. In the biomaterials in artworks, uh, we have the example of the silk pavilion from Nettie Oxman. Uh, she is working in the biomedia lab in MIT. And uh, she used hundreds of silk worms to live create this pavilion. So they had the initial structure uh, made from some silks and metals. And they put uh, they, I mean, a group of scientists and uh, Mary Oxman put hundreds of these little silkworms to live there in the gallery. And the silkworms were moving about around this pavilion, making the cocoons, uh, making silk, and the pavilion was being created. Uh, this was a very interesting artwork in the perception of curatorial uh, process because the worms were falling all the time. And there was always three or four uh, guys in white coats taking the worms and putting back into the pavilion. And then the worms also will create a cocoon, have metamorphosis and become a fly. So they, they were also flying all around the museum. Uh, and it's also very interesting when you're working with uh, animals in bioart, how you will present it. So, uh, now let's have a small dynamic. Uh, I wanted to, to break uh, the participants into rooms, but however, I think this um, Zoom do, does not allow me to make rooms in, in the Zoom. I don't know why, maybe it was one of the preferences um, when we organized the, the Zoom call. So, um, instead of breaking into rooms, let's uh, make rooms by our, uh, make teams by ourselves. And uh, you can discuss maybe in the chat um, or just read uh, alone and then I ask to all the group. So what is the activity? You will have um, a project or an artwork or a project and read about it. And later we will share if it is, if you can see that there is a bio art 
a product or artwork, or if it's a bio design, mostly mostly bio design. I need to make a disclaimer. Some of them will be both uh, artwork and a product, but just let me know about your opinions. So uh, let me stop the presentation. Here, uh, do you see uh, Excel file, right? Mm -hmm. So here are different links. Uh, we don't have rooms, so what we will do, how many people we have? We ha have 13 people, 14. Let's make groups of uh, three or four. So just put your name here, for example, um, yeah, you can say like if Alena, you choose the first one, put Alena, and then the next person like Henry, and then a third person. So it should be three persons. And you click here and read about the project. Or, and then we come back in, I guess, uh, at 11 to share uh, what are your thoughts if you think that it's a bio art or if it is a bio design product. So let me share with you. Wait. Okay, I will share this. Is it clear the activity? Do you have some questions? Excuse me, Laura. Yeah, I have some <laughs> questions yeah. about uh, this thing. So uh, we should decide uh, if it's bio art or bio design, and then we will meet again tomorrow or today. Today, uh, in 10 minutes. Today. Oh, in 10 minutes, okay. <laughs> yeah, so it's just like a, a, a quick lecture, very fast, just take a scan. Yeah. Uh, so put your put names here, please. Uh, open the, the link and choose which one do you want to read. Three persons can choose the same. Uh, and where can we get the link to this table? I, uh, yeah, sorry, I, I think it. I put it in the chat, but I put it just for one, uh, like in private. So now everyone can see it, right? The chat, the link. Yeah, yeah, I see people here. So just put your name in one next to it and let me know which one you choose. And do it fast because we, ten, we have 10 minutes. <laughs> Okay, um, and also I want to ask, I don't know, better after the break, I will tell you. Laura, sorry, yeah. could you maybe send uh, link number seven because I'm joining from my iPad and I can't click it. Okay, is this one, La, La Biotech? Yes. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah, you're welcome. So um, let's meet at 11, 11.05. Mm. Yeah, 11.05. 11, like 11, 
here. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm telling I'm, I'm, I'm telling the the time in in Mexico. It's not eleven. Uh, so let's meet in seven fourteen minutes. So yeah. I think some of you is like 6 p.m. Another is like 10 p.m. So in 14 minutes, <laughs> we come back. Mm -hmm. And please, if some of you get ethanol or some um, alcohol that I, I ask uh, for you to take, for the materials, put it now in the freezer or in the fridge, better in the freezer. Excuse me, so our goal is just mm -hmm. discuss these projects, yeah? Yeah, just to tell me if, if it is more bio art focus or bio, or, uh, bio design. Okay, thanks. Okay, I repeat, if you've got ethanol or a strong alcohol uh, in the materials, uh, put it now into the freezer, please, to make it ice cold. See you soon.
Hi there. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi, hello. Okay. Um, I hope you also have time to drink water or something. <laughs> so we are uh, in the middle of, of the activity for today. Uh, after this, we will start with the experiment. So let's try to make it short. Uh, Let's have like one minute to just explain uh, a bit of these projects that you just read. And anyway, you have the link so you can all of you watch all the projects and maybe get inspired for your next, next artwork. So uh, let's share a screen back. So we have, okay, Hussein. What can you tell us about this project? Is Hussein here? Not yet? Okay, let's then go to the next one. Angel, Angel, are you here? Yes. Okay, what can you tell us about this modified paradise dress? Yeah, okay, okay. Um, I think it's very interesting. Um, I finally um, uh, finished a more um, bio art work than bio design because it focused mm -hmm. in the in the in the medium or the process of the installation. No? Uh, it's an installation mm -hmm. uh, called modified paradise. Uh, by another farm, it's a collective of artists. And they use a silkworm that were modified, uh, genetic modified, adding some genes from uh, jellyfish and, or, and coral. And so the result is a silkworm that uh, the silk is glowing or luminescent silk. And mm -hmm. if you can see in installation, a dress that is Luminescent. Yes. Let's see if I can, yeah, some other pictures here. Yes. So, so I, I mm -hmm. no, the, uh, it's focusing the aesthetic. So, no, uh, the aesthetic reason for a, for a, for a dress, not for uh, another reason. Yeah, I, I also agree that it was presented as a bio art project. Uh, but it has the ability to become a biodesign. Like, I would love to get married in a glowing jellyfish <laughs> dress. <laughs> so thank you, thank you, Angel. Um, this project is was also in Ars Electronica and two years ago, three, three years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, it, this uh, collective of uh, artists are working with biomaterials genetically modified. Okay, thank you, Angel. Let's go, uh, Hassan and Nastia. Let's start. Hassan, what can you tell us about this project? Actually, it's uh, it's the, there is a collaboration uh, to make a kind of bio art. I agree, it's bio art because. At the end, it's it cannot be functionalized into uh, some furniture or something like that. It's just uh, how uh, the, the the biomaterials collaborate to create some light uh, on the circuit, uh, uh, and it's linked with the Arduino. So uh, I think it's kind of experiment to see the effect of the bio biomaterials and how it can create uh, some uh, benefits in the electronic circuit. This is my opinion, mm -hmm. actually. Okay, thank you, Hassan. Uh, do you have something else to add, Anastasia? Uh, I think a little bit differently because uh, in the end of the article, there is more about the practical usage of this technology. So I thought that it uh, it is more about the bio design, but of course it can be used in bio art because it looks interesting in my opinion uh, but uh, i think that it is more um, bio design okay like like the scientists are trying to find the functionality of this 
Uh, yes, uh, there's uh, some stuff about the technical usage in the end of the article. Or, or maybe I just read it all wrong. I don't know. <laughs> no, I think there, there is not uh, uh, good or wrong, or right or wrong. Um, as I mentioned, I think a lot of these um, technologies can just use in both sense. Yeah, depending of the, even depend of how the author of the article wrote about it. So maybe someone else, uh, some artist or curator have wrote about this technology, the, the measures will have been different. So uh, I, I think that it mostly depends on the direction of the writer or the author or the creator. But again, it's, it's a material that can be used for create artworks. Uh, and then I think we have seen that what it defines an artwork is also the concept behind it. And what defines the product is the functionality. I don't know if you agree with that. Okay, well, I, I will take silence like yes. <laughs> Then uh, Christiana and Kira, who wants to start? I can begin. That's mm -hmm. Christiana, please. And I made some Christiana. comments in the document as well, uh, in the Excel. Um, my feeling with, so this project is, um, genetically modified silkworms, they, they, the, they produce silk with oxyca and the love hormone. Um, and it, yeah, it's based upon uh, this, the Red King of Fate uh, story. Um, and I think also it was to challenge someone's idea or any individual's idea about um, the, if, if, genetic modification is truly a bad thing or if it can also produce some very positive things as well. Um, my feeling was the project is mostly in, in the ambition of bio art, um, but like later they did produce a dress and that seems to lean more uh, design. And I, yes, this one here. So mm -hmm. I understand as both, but I think the original artist maybe was looking at it as a, a singular artwork, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, Kira, do you want to add something? Yeah, I also think that this is mostly bio art idea. So uh, this, uh, was, uh, this experiment was designed to prove the idea maybe of how our perception of uh, love can oh, be translated one. into tissues, living tissues, hey. and so on. So, yeah, I think it's purely bio art thing. But uh, with this dress, uh, they have uh, the senses that you know you can't fall in love just walking in this dress. So, yeah, <laughs> this is purely <laughs> ideal thing. So. True, true. I, I completely agree with both of you. Um, and so Sputnik, uh, uh, she takes the, um, uh, this myth that we are connected to our soulmate by an invisible red string. So that's why she modified the silk. Uh, they are like the red silk of faith. And indeed, uh, she presented uh, they uh, presented as an artwork, Sputniko, and the artist actually, the name Sputniko is like her artistic persona. Uh, she has very cool uh, artworks um, presented as videos. Uh, so here she is. Um, let me show you just how she looks like. Um, when she, she's a scientist, but, uh, and when she's working as a scientist, this is her persona. But then uh, when she presented herself as an artist, she, uh, she changes her persona. 
and wear different wearables, different type of makeup. And she has a video when she's a teenager uh, that she wants to fall in love. Uh, she's in love with another uh, teenager scientist. And then she, in order to make him fall in love, she creates this drink. Uh, and it's like a comic. Uh, she's very inspired by the Easter, Eastern uh, comics and uh, manga and different type uh, of literature like that. So I will send you later the video because it's really interesting to see uh, this type of pan by your artworks. And uh, she was also working in the media MIT. So thank you, thank you girls. Uh, let's go um, with Sean. Yeah, I pronounced it correctly. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, Sean. <Sure. laughs> and yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, this project I I think is an artwork project made by Elena, and it is inspired by um, uh, some kind of tea. And uh, and the bacteria and yeast that made the tea, and which uh, we know tea is really good for people, uh, good for our bodies. And so the artists want to visualize this kind of like uh, bacteria or yeast to make it some kind of material, like uh, and make it into some like glove and some texture, I guess, right? <laughs> and. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's very interesting that it can be some new material that can use on Mars or uh, replacements of textiles. So I guess it has some uh, bio design potential. True, right, right you are. Thank you very much. Has any one of you have worked with kombucha before with this type of uh, tape? No? Uh, kombucha bio Couture. It was first introduced by Susan Lee. Uh, you can do it very simple in your home. Uh, have you ever drink kombucha? You know this drink yeah. is uh, a tea. Yeah, so uh, this tea has different bacteria and yeast, and one of the bacteria is called Acetobacter. And this Acetobacter creates cellulose bacterial cellulose, there is a protein. And it comes as a layer of cellulose, so you can grow it and you can grow it in big containers. So you will have a big layer of cellulose and then you wash it, it's very strong. So you can wash it with, like, with soap and like, your hands to remove the, the smell of the tea that is not really nice smell. And then you can dry it and this can work as a fabric. So Susan Lee, start this trend with biocouture uh, when she was using the bacteria to create fabric and even make some uh, dresses and some other clothes. Uh, so in this case, when you are working with the biomaterial to make a product, it will be biodesign, but it can be also used to make an artwork and will be bio art. The only disadvantage of this product now is that it absorbs water. It's very hydrophilic. So imagine that uh, you have your beautiful dress of kombucha and then you go out and there is, a, there is rain. So suddenly you will be naked walking around because it will absorb a lot of water and fall apart. So that's why it's still not a very nice product in, for biodesign, but it's nice in the idea that it's changing their perception of how to create clothes. Thank you, thank you. And uh, it's very, it's very cheap to work with this. I have worked with uh, kombucha, so you only need water and sugar. Uh, if you are interested, I can send you like the protocol to make this. Okay, let's move forward. Oh, Henry, you have a very interesting project. Yeah. So this project right now it's not neither bio art or bio design. It's more uh, about it's more like a toolkit that can uh, that use genetic engineering to transfer like bacteria into colors. Uh, so it's like scientists you spend a, su a summer like make uh, make bacteria uh, can uh, have a range of colors like red, yellow, blue. Uh, yeah, but they also mention 
it can have a uh, potential opportunities for like uh, food usage or like a uh, personal medicare. So uh, in the future, this uh, bio like engineering toolkit can be used into bio design projects. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I will consider it also more uh, as already kind of bio design, speculative, uh, yeah. because I'm not sure we will be really happy to drink and to understand what bacteria we have when we see our, our poop in different colors. It's quite interesting and brave project to be presented. It was presented in the IGM uh, MIT uh, contest when the students from different high schools uh, make projects with synthetic biology. Uh, and in this case, uh, was the artist, Dais, uh, Alexandra Daisy Ginsburg, that also coordinated this group to students. So, uh, yeah, I, I also agree that it has some potential to bio product, but it has been also presented as an artwork, like a speculative, because it's so brave, uh, the Ooh. idea that you can. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you can put in different colors in order to understand what bacteria lives on you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Henry. Okay, um, so uh, Christiana, because you already explained one, uh, I will just go to run this, okay? Yes, yep. Okay, thank you, just for the sake of time. So Randy, what can you tell us about it? Well, this is a very interesting project. It's a thing that is a, well, bio design project. And it's a project that uh, the artists imagine working with the nature to create elements that can serve as a tools of parts of a product that can be ultimately assembled, I think so. So yeah. it's like uh, thinking in a, in, in a plant-based product I think so true so it's like how to grow our own tools mm -hmm. so it's very product uh, um, directed like for fun functionality and like, that like, the, like the watermelons that we can see in the internet like they are like cubes ah uh, yeah that's that's cool <laughs> water um water map Hmm. Internet is so, uh, but also it's a speculative, right? Because uh, sometimes, so far, we cannot do that. We cannot create uh, a tool. I don't know why the internet is. Ah, oh, yeah. So far, is uh, I where I left it. Uh, here. It's a speculative, so it can also enter to a speculative artwork. So as you can see, it's the same artist, uh, Alexandra Daisy Ginsburg, and she works with this project that is so difficult to understand if it is really bio art or is that bio design because she's driven by functionality, but it's a speculative. So it can also enter as, as a new statement or philosophical idea or related with products. So thank you, Randy. Anyone has another question or comment? Be free to, to share, please. If not, we go to the last one, Alexandra and Barbara. Barbara, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I think it's uh, biodesign. Uh, it's a speculative uh, like scenario how we can turn rubbish into power, into the power in our living spaces. So this uh, microbial home is creating like a self-sufficient uh, circular um, um, structure in our living spaces. So, uh, and it's focused on how we 
um, how we produce, how we prepare foods in our houses, and how we can um, use waste and turn it into the power on just to supply another machine that helps us in uh, storage our food. So for me, it's a kind of speculative uh, vision of our living spaces in the future. Um, yeah, so for me, it's more designed uh, art because it shows that it could be possible. Um, and we need just, I think this kind of collaboration between designer and the scientific engineering side to make it happen. Thank you, Margaret. Alexandra, would you like to add something? Uh, yes, first, uh, my thoughts was the same uh, as Barbara's, so I agree with her. Uh, this is a um, very utilitarian um, concept, but um, if we um, try to think deeper, I think it consists some part of um, art, uh, because it make make us uh, rethink uh, how we produce, how we consume, and how far we um, gone from nature. And maybe how can we bring nature back to our homes to make them um, like um, self-sufficient ecosystems. Uh, so I strongly believe that uh, we have this difference between art and design. Design is uh, more utilitarian and uh, Art uh, can make people um, think about future, about um, maybe some philosophical statements. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, this concept consists um, the, the uh, art part. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alexandra. Yeah, I, I also agree with this idea that you mentioned of how art makes you think about the possibilities. And yeah, the speculative part that also Barbara mentioned here um, is making this project as an artwork too. Is it? It is a biodesign, uh, but it was also presented as an artwork in the gallery. So uh, that, that's the intersection. That's why it cannot be a real difference between biodesign and, and bio art. However, uh, again, as you said, the functionality and the, the bio the bioscience is more utilitarian, but uh, it can be a combination of both. So um, uh, this uh, project you can also find it in this last book projects. It's just the preview of a book called Biodesign, and I recommend you for you if you are interested in biodesign and bio art to take. Um, and if you would like just to take a look in the preview, here is in the, la the last the last links of the Excel. So thank you guys, thank you for your uh, feedback of the projects. So now let's go to put hands in practice. Will you uh, you receive an email right where you were asked to bring some materials, right? Yes. yes. Okay. So um, all of you have some plants and leaves. Can you show it to me? Let's stop sharing and show your plants or leaves. I see Angel. Good. Oh, yeah, that's so beautiful. The, the large one, Angel. Excellent. Yeah, Alina, good. Oh, ha Hassan, yeah, so the flower, flowers. Oh, the lilies, yeah, the lilies are beautiful. Okay, good, Hassan, good. Okay, Kira, show me. Uh-huh, what type of plant is this one, Kira? It's like a butterfly type uh, plant. This is not a flower, oh, okay. this is the leaves, so... The leaves, uh-huh, okay. Like that. <laughs> that looks beautiful. It is, it is green or like purple? Can you tell me? Uh, it can be a green and purple, but this one is purple, yeah. Okay, good. So, yeah, <laughs> we'll see oh, what yes. happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Henry, nice. Okay. Okay, we're waiting for Christiana, Nastia, Randy, same. Good. Um, so uh, for the big flowers or big leaves, um, I recommend you maybe to, to save them now. You will make it, um, you can take this, like for example, the big lilies uh, and make the experiment with them uh, after. But now take a small piece uh, like a, a leaf or something small, just for the practice. So it will be easier for you to work with it because if it is a big plant, you will need a big container to, to put the whole plant immersed in the solution. If you have it already, it's okay. Then you can make the, the, the big plant. But you will need more time like to put more water and so on. Uh, so you can choose, I see that you have different samples. You can select one for now during the next half hour. And after the workshop, or, uh, you can make your other samples or go and find more <laughs> and experiment. So I was doing these experiments on my kitchen during the pandemic. So uh, it was, my kitchen just looked like a, a greenhouse uh, with a lot of plants. So I, I hope your kitchen will look like that too. You will have fun. So, um, let's, let me just ask Christiana, Henry, Randy, Nasty, are you here? You have your samples? Ah, I see. Uh, I want to <laughs> ask, is it possible to decelerize something like that? Can you put it closer to the camera, please? Something like berries? Uh, but like berries. Probably yes, but it will take longer. Okay, so, uh, or can I use uh, the two samples, the flower and this leaf? Yeah, yeah. You can also put it together if you have a big container for both of them. Okay. So, what are we doing? Basically, we are removing the cells from the plants. This is called the cellularization. And you can remove the cells from plant tissue, but also from animal tissue. What you're seeing here, sorry, it is a heart of a chicken. And it was put under a solution that breaks the cells and leave on, leaves only the structure. The structure is made of a protein. Uh, that's why it looks like this transparent thing. And you can see these are samples of the tissue where there is a lot of cells, then less cells. And then in the last one is almost no cells. Everything broke and fall apart and you only have the structure. Uh, this was made for first time uh, in a heart. It was actually a, hum uh, a big heart uh, in 2008. And recently we start to use but well, the scientists already start to use the decellularized plants to look for a transplant tissue in the cardiac tissue. So you see the spinach leaf has a lot of veins, veins like venation, and uh, it can be used as uh, already channels to conduct the blood of our system. And there will be the blood of the patient and in this structure, empty structure, you can put the cells of the patient. So it's not gonna be rejected. You remember like Marta de Menezes rejected the skin of her husband because it was not hers, because she has an immune system. But if you, you can put back cells in these structures and it can be cells from another organism. So you remove the vegetal cells and you can put skin cells, for example, or cardiac cells. So, I, I'm fascinated by this research. I start to work with it. And I one of the first projects I did is called Becoming Plant. What I did is decellularize different uh, plants. As I told you, there is a technique called decellularization that was first made in hearts. Uh, but then we start to work with plants. Basically what they use is a very strong detergent called SDS. 
and they use it at 10%, or they also make another very strong detergent called Triton X100. Basically, the detergent that you use for washing your clothes in the uh, washing machine is based in Triton X. And they also use uh, chloride or bleach uh, and very low concentrations. What that will make is to break the cells and they will start to fall from this skeleton. So becoming plant is an artwork that try to present the fragility of the and the no, the fragility of the notions of identity. When I remove the cells from a whole flower, I still see a flower. I don't know if you can see the, like perceive there is a flower, but there is no flower anymore because it's, there is no cells. So I also started to think uh, like about myself from a very scientific point of view, I consider myself like a configuration of cells. Like I have DNA in each of them and they are expressing different parts of the DNA. And all of this is making a biochemistry in my brain that give me consciousness. So, and then I'm, I'm a very, let's say blessed uh, structure of, uh, of cells. But also a plant is another structure of cells. And this structure is changing all the day, you, all the time. You are uh, losing cells, like 8,000 cells of your skin every day. Um, if you drink uh, pineapple juice, for example, you are breaking the cells of your thumb because the pineapple uh, juice have an enzyme that break cells. So you drink juice and you are breaking your own structure and then it regenerates again. And I don't know, uh, Nastya, what did you have for dinner or breakfast or your last meal? What did you eat? Uh, or something. Yeah, what did you eat? What was your last meal? Do you ask me or? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> uh, I ate cereals. <laughs> cereals, okay. So cereals have a lot of uh, carbo carbohydrates. So, and this is a lot of carbons and hydrogens and oxygens. So the cereals that you ate, now you're using it to make energy that is a molecule called ATP to hear me through the computer. So you are part of cereals now, and these cereals will become also part of something else. So I ate eggs in the morning, for example, and I'm now part egg, but this egg breaks into other particles. And then later, when I go to the street and I, um, several of my cells will fall in the street, this carbons and oxygens and nitrogens will become part of something else, maybe part of a new plant or part of um, an insect that will eat this little cell of, of, the, of my skin or something like this. So we are in a constant changing process. And when I thought about the idea that the cells is not only what gives us our identity, but also the shape and the form, like we have a construct of what is a plant, based on the form or on the shape that it has. So the idea was how to reclaim the botanical forms um, and how to become with another organism, how to become uh, with a plant. And becoming with came from the, the, Luce, uh, the Lucian uh, idea of becoming with another entity when you create something new. So when you get in a dog, for example, or when you interact with some other human being, you are not only yourself anymore, but you are a combination of the interactions that you have with others. And we, if we try to deconstruct it more, even you can say that my name, my name is Laura, but I, I'm not Laura. Laura is just a sound that I was learned or trained to recognize as myself. But Laura is just, uh, a few syllables that my parents decide. So who I am as, as an entity is not Laura, it's, uh, that, that's just a sound. So the idea of deconstruct your own body, 
by the constructing the plants was what inspired this project to make implants. So in the laboratory, we have the empty shapes when we remove the cells from the plant. So imagine that you can put back skin cells, you will have the, uh, an implant that won't be rejected into the skin uh, of the user. Uh, and ideally, I would really like to have uh, an implant like this. However, I need to make the disclaimer that this is a speculative project that was presented uh, as photographies and as an atelier in the gallery where you enter to the room and you can see different decellularized plants and choose the one you would like. And uh, there was like pictures of how is the process of insertion. Um, and what happened once you get the shape of another organism. So you can become with another entity. So there was also some instructions of how you need to change after you get your transplant uh, made of the plant, because now you are becoming with another entity. For example, your water consumption should change. Like plants do not consume water as same as humans. Your relationship with insects will change. Like as humans, if we see a spider, uh, sometimes we in, in our skin, well, you just throw it away or, to, or kill it if you are afraid of them or something. But as a plant, you are hosting the spiders, for example. So your relationship with insects will change once you get your transplant. Um, we are, and the instructions after your transplant, you also need to make some uh, blossoming exercise, for example. So the idea of becoming a plant is not um, to imitate a plant, but to make a new, kind of uh, new behavior, hu half human, half plant, let's say part and part, not, I'm not sure if half or half. Uh, so this project um, is also evolving into different uh, sculptures of the cellularized plants. That is what you are gonna do now. So indeed uh, you could decellularize the whole plant. This was a tulip and these were uh, some small grasses. Uh, but as you can see, it should be immerse in, in the water, um, in the solution, in order to cover and remove all the cells. So if your plant is quite big, you will need uh, like a jar or, or something. Uh, I also have used just um, plastic boxes. So it, it, it shouldn't be all the time vertical. It can be also horizontal, but it should be able to be in the water completely. Okay, um, and then what uh, we're doing now um, is uh, 3D mapping in these structures. Uh, and what we're 3D mapping is the um, uh, perception of, of what can be the, the um, essence of the plant. So I, I keep wondering about what makes us human, what makes us plant, what, make, what is conscious. So, as, as human, we have a conscious, that, that's the idea that evolved into a soul. Mm, in Mexican culture, we have the idea of uh, that animals also can have a soul and they evolve when they died into some kind of alebrije, that is a chimera uh, made of different colors. If you have seen in some Mexican movie cartoons about the day of the dead, you might have seen these chimera monsters made of like dog with wings or this kind of stuff. And uh, I was wondering, of, like a plant can, a plant perceives the world. A plant can perceive it is hot, if it, where is water, if there is movement, for example, the plant can perceive it, but it's not conscious about it. So there is not a soul of, 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 a, of a plant, but it's a cognate soul. So my idea was to combine the meat of a um, pseudo soul of plants with a consciousness. Uh, so what we are 3D mapping and now in the plants is uh, the idea of what the consciousness can represent. So we have these structures of decellularized plants and project on, on them different memories uh, that are associated with these plants, uh, different patterns of these alebrijes that are like the animal soul uh, in the whole 
Mexican folklore. And uh, so just this is just to show you uh, some of the ideas that you can uh, implement with decelerized plants, but I will be very happy to see what you came up. And after uh, this class, what you will do is not only have the structure itself, the living structure, but your digital twin. And uh, I think this is even more interesting to see how a digital entity will, can, can also combine with the living system. So uh, how to make the transparent uh, plants? Uh, first, we need to break the cell wall. All the plants have cells that have two membranes. Well, one is a wall and the other is a membrane. So we need to break these two boundaries around and then destroy all the little organelles like the nucleus that has DNA and the mitochondria. So we need just to break everything and it will start to fall from the structure. So if we break the cells, what, what remains? So if there is no cells, what, what is this transparent thing? This transparent thing is a protein, cellulose is vegetal cellulose and is the one that we can use to make paper, for example. Uh, so what we will need right now is your plants, your containers, bleach and dishwasher or soap, liquid soap and water. Um, do you need time to go for your materials or are we already set up? Yes, actually just to bring some water. Uh, what about the ethanol? Mm -hmm. Should we bring it from the fridge? Uh, it, uh, what water? So, sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, I need to bring some water. But what about the ethanol? Mm -hmm. Should we bring it from the fridge? I not yet, not yet. Okay. Leave it okay, in the okay. fridge. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you. So, yeah, everyone, you will need some water. So, uh, show me your container. So. If you have a big plan, you need like a cylinder. Okay, Kira, perfect, that works. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, Hassan, yeah, that works. Angel, yeah, perfect, that also works. You have a Petri dish, Alexandra, awesome. Yeah, that completely works. Mm -hmm. Alina, and your, your leaf, uh, Alena, uh, is there, like, can fit there? I have smaller one, <laughs> this. Yeah, good, then, perfect. Um, Do I need something to cover it because I have like this big uh, cup? No, uh, oh, no, you yeah. don't need, it can be open. Yeah. All right. I also okay, have a so conceive. Mm -hmm. uh, if yeah. I have several leaves like, uh, this one and this one and, <laughs> and my one. So uh, can I took them all into one container or I can do, I should do it separately? Uh, you can do in the one container. Okay. Uh, however, I think it's a good idea to have separate so you can be, you can make pic pictures of the process of each. Okay. But you can put uh, uh, two or three, uh, in the same container. Meanwhile, there is water around, it will work. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. So, uh, do you see, still see my screen or do you see a black square? Your screen. You see my screen? We see screen. Okay, perfect. So, uh, first estimate how much water you need to add. So don't add yet water, just estimate. It should be roughly, you know, it's not, uh, now we are not making um, something super accurate. It will work if you put less, more, but it's like, if it is a cup of water, it's like 250 milliliters. So make your estimation, like how much? Mm -hmm. Okay. So more, you have the idea of how much water you will need to add, like if there is a liter, good. So now you need to uh, estimate the 20% you will add in dishwasher. For example, if you will add 100 milliliters of water, 
you need 20 milliliters of the soap or dishwasher or shampoo. Can you show me your, this, your soap, please? What type of soap do you have? So for those in Russia, it's like fairy. Uh, for those, um, I think, I don't know if in the USA you have Salvo or I don't know the brands. Yeah, okay, uh, Aleona, good, okay, good. Fairy, yes. Kira, what do you have? Henry, okay, Henry, this is for hands. Or for dish, yeah, for hands. Yeah, for hands. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh -huh. so, good. So I will, sorry, Kira, can you show again and DNC? This, this washer? Yeah, this was okay. fair, of course. <laughs> fair, good, okay. So uh, for Aliona and Henry, I will ask you to double the amount um so instead of 20 percent will be 40 percent okay because it should be as strong as we can the mixture okay alexandra what type of uh soap do you have fairy yeah okay that works so first uh start to add your uh soap around 20% of the whole container. Mm -hmm. For a Henry and Elena, like 40%. Don't worry if it is not accurate. Uh, yeah. Okay, Asan, are you showing something? How does your water? Yeah, this water and the soap together. Okay. Just one second. Good. Let me. Okay. So all of you have water and soap. Ready? What is happening? Uh, or why we add? Uh, detergent and so so the detergent is made of different particles and in this image they are in like white gray color and these particles these um, proteins are very similar to the lipids uh, another uh, type of molecules of the cell membrane of the plant so this spiral will come here. These spirals get formed in the, in the water uh, when you mix the detergent and the water. So they are the heads that you see here, like these balls, they are called heads. They are hydrophilic, so they like water, but the little legs, they are hydrophobic, so they don't like water. That's why they make this structure. They make like circles uh, that protects the legs from the water and the water outside is here. So when these structures are being made, it can also take similar uh, molecules from the cell membrane and it breaks the cell membrane. Meanwhile, it's making these spirals. Uh, this is how your soap is killing the bacteria in your hands when you wash your hands or your soap is breaking the fat when you are washing the dirty dishes that you had from last, last night dinner. So this is how soap works. And with this, we're gonna break the cell membrane of your plant. Then you will add bleach. All of you have bleach? No, I Let's don't have bleach. Add what it will be. You don't have bleach, uh, then who, who, okay. If you don't have bleach, just add much more um, soap. Yeah, Alexandra, that works. Uh, Lena, okay. yes, Hassan, bleaching liquid, yes. Yeah, every anything that you're used to whitening, it's okay. Uh, if you don't have bleach, you can go and find in your, where you save your chemicals for home, like 
any strong soap, like if you have uh, Mr. Clean or So basically, once you start breaking the cells, everything will start falling apart. But to accelerate the process, we use bleach. Uh, put around one, like ten percent, or if, and then you add the water. If you already add water, then you put uh, bleach until the top. Okay. Basically, bleach. Uh, will help also to break the, um, the membrane, but also to remove pigments. How the bleach does that? It adds oxygen. The oxidation process, more oxygen are around the molecules. Our eyes do not detect the color around. So, that's why it looks like white when there is a lot of bleach. And add water. Mm -hmm. And then do you also have salt? You can add half spoon of salt. And the salt, what it will make is to break the nucleus. In the cell, you have the cell with a membrane and inside you have a nucleus that have the DNA. So the well, salt will also... Yeah? Could I ask if I add water at the beginning, should I add it one more time? No. Okay. No. All right. Yeah. You can add salt and then mix a bit. That all the ingredients, all the solution is mixed the soap, the salt, and add your sample inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now add your sample. Yeah, mix if there is some uh, salt still. The solution should be trans almost transparent. Uh, sometimes the liquid soap has a lot of Colorant, don't worry if it's not completely transparent, it will still work. And add your sample. Uh, so you have some. Uh, I think you have reactions. If you are ready, you can just like send, like everything is okay. Okay, tell me, how is it going? Is everyone ready? I put in your samples. Mm -hmm, I see, good, Hassan. Mm -hmm. Good. I will add more water and a little bit more bleach so it covers all the sample. It will float for, for the first days because there is still oxygen in your cells. In the cells of the plant, there is oxygen, so it will float. But then when the cells start to disintegrate, it will start to going down. Mm -hmm. And one important note, I will write it in the chat. Tomorrow, if your plan is still like um, very green or still not so, not so, if you don't see any change, then you need to add more chloride and soap. If you don't see any change, 
more bleach and soap. But usually in four hours or even less, you will start to notice some whitening points. Mm -hmm. Angel, good. If you have the caps of the petri dishes, you can cap it, but it's not necessary. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, but the mix uh, mm -hmm. turns white. It's white. It's not transparent. Yep. Good. Okay. Not transparent. Um, you use bleach. What type of soap? This. Can you show me uh, your soap? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, it's okay. I think it's 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 yeah. white uh, because it also has bubbles, no? Like foam. It has foam. Yeah, I don't know. I I think uh, I mix in, in another order the the component. It, it shouldn't it shouldn't matter. It's okay. Uh, can you put? Maybe your camera like this, so I could see your uh, petri dish. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you already put the the plant now, right? Yes. The leaf. Yes. Okay. Ah, yeah, I see. Uh huh. It for this. What did? You... Uh -huh. Okay. Do you have another sample? Yes. I will try again. Yeah. Let's. Yeah. Let's try. Uh, maybe do not add salt. Just add soup and bleach and a bit of water. When I Sorry, I just have one problem. There yeah, is a me. part of it. There is a part of it still outside. It's a floating. Uh, uh -huh. There is a part of it still outside. Like, can you see? Yes, I see. Okay. Uh, do you have the cap? Yeah, yeah, I have it. Yeah. Okay. What you can do is, okay, you cap it and time to time, uh, when you remember it, come and shake it. Okay. So okay. you will be the okay to. Mm -hmm. Like every, you. when you remember every two hours, every eight hours, it's it's gonna be okay. okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Any other um, difference? Any other comment? How is it going, Kira? Barbara, Alexandra. Wait, so what change Christiana. should happen like mm -hmm. right now for the leaf? Right now, almost nothing. Okay. Uh, in around in around four hours, you will start to notice some um and more uh oh. bleach. Oh sorry, do you still hear me? All right.
Ah, apologies. Do you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, my the the battery of the microphone went down. Okay. So, is everyone ready with their samples? Yeah. Okay. So, yep. Uh, uh, when we use the ethanol now or what? Yeah. Yeah, just wait a moment. <laughs> we are going to make it now. Yeah. Okay. So this is the first part of uh, the experiment that is the one you will keep using tomorrow. Okay. Tomorrow, not tomorrow, in two days. Tomorrow you will start to see the transparency in the flowers. If not, please add more bleach or more soap. Uh, you can start making pictures of it, but probably in two days, in around 48 hours, it will be mostly transparent and you will take pictures of it in order to have a library that will help you to make the new designs uh, with Masha, with Mar Maria, uh, in order to create like the digital twin uh, of your biological entity. So, um, or I'm, I'm sorry, we're a bit back in the schedule, but um, to add another experiment during this first day, uh, I would like to ask you to isolate your own DNA. And for that is what we need the ethanol. So we're gonna make a homemade extraction. Have you ever isolated your own DNA? Barbara, is that, no? <laughs> okay, so we are killing the cells of the plants, but we are also able with the same basic, basic the same materials, able to break our own cells. So the first thing you need to get water, uh, like a, a sip of water, and you will put a half spoon or one spoon, of, uh, let's say like teaspoon, one teaspoon of salt, and you will make gargles with it. So I will make it with you. Are you ready to isolate your DNA? Do you want? <laughs> what we can uh, do is break your cells from the cheeks. Uh, for that, you will need water and put salt, and then you need to make gargles. Like that will make that your cheeks will lose a lot of cells, like your thong. And in your cells, there is also DNA. So I will go for water and salt. And also bring a transparent glass or transparent cup or plastic maybe if you have. Mm -hmm. Take it and have it in your mouth like one minute or something. Try to take samples, take your And split it in your glass or, and you can take a little bit of water <laughs> because the salty water is not a very good flavor. 
Mm -hmm. Good, Hassan. Good. So basically, right now, yeah, Barbara, good. Right now, um, you took cells and the cells start to break the membrane of your cells. The mammal or animal cells only have one, one boundary, the membrane. You remember that the um, plant have two, a cell wall and a membrane, but animal only have the membrane. So now it's getting break. Um, it's breaking, sorry, it's breaking white salt. And please add half spoon of liquid soap, the same liquid soap that you were using. Half teaspoon or like three, three drops should be enough also. Mm -hmm. Let me try to show. Actually, I think this is too much for me. Should be a little bit less, like half half of the teaspoon. And actually, if you drop, you can see how immediately something like uh, moves like this. Um, if you make a drop in the solution, it will separate a bit. Mix it, mix it a bit. So with the soap, we are also breaking the membrane cell, the, the, sorry, the membrane of the nucleus to let the DNA out. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, leave it there for a moment. Leave it there. Try, the, try to not make so much foam that stays there. Mm -hmm. Can you show me your samples? Yep, good, good, good. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, then we will add the ice cold um, ethanol, yeah, ethanol that you have. What it will happen is that um, the ethanol will make a uh, group of the DNA, RNA, and little small proteins. So actually, this is not real clean DNA. It's DNA, RNA, and small proteins. So you cannot use this to make, a, I don't know, research in, or publish a paper in science. But still, it will be interesting to see if there is a small uh, strings. So what you will see some very small uh, strings, transparent white, white tissue. White, a little bit white. So what you will do is to take the cold ethanol and pull by the side. So try not to mix it, just by the side, slowly. So um, maybe let me remove my phone so it will be easier to see. Um, So you will add by the side your ethanol. I actually couldn't find ethanol here where I am in the city where I found when, I, when I'm living right now. Um, so I sadly cannot make it that part with you, but I can tell you how we should pour, like by the side. Try not to mix. And if it is cold enough, it will stay in the top. Don't mix it. Don't mix it. It will be like two layers. Do you see like two layers? Try to add more ethanol. And do not mix it. Just leave it there. And slowly, some white things is, will start probably to come up. You can make this a same... A, the same experiment, instead of uh, your cheeks, you can just smash a strawberry and that will be much more effective. You will see uh, how it will go up. Mm -hmm. Do you see some white stuff, Hassan? Some white little strings.
Actually, not yet. Okay, maybe wait a bit. If not, doesn't mean that you don't have DNA, you have DNA. <laughs> but probably we needed to, col <laughs> to collect more sample. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I see it now. <laughs> yes? Can I yes. ask? Um, yeah? How much alcohol do we have to add to it? That like the double, the double of the volume that you have. Okay. You can actually do the same methodology with salt and soap, but instead of uh, your cells, use a strawberry or kiwi also works. Banana, not so good, but also still works. And you put soap and salt and break the, the, the strawberry. Then you filter it. So you have like a more pure liquid, you put the soap and then you will add the ethanol by the side. And it's easier there to see this whitening, transparent little strings. This is the DNA of the strawberry. And you can take it outside, dry it, and you will see how strong. When you dry DNA, it just looks like a rock. So I, um, even if right now you don't get uh, a lot of strings, oh, I invite you to keep trying this methodology with other fruits, with more, maybe more um, samples from your mouth. And you will be maybe inspired by create some something with the DNA from different things. And it's something that you can still do from your home. Uh, I think I lost you. <laughs> I don't see you anymore. Let, let me stop sharing my screen to see you. Do you see something, Leona or Barbara, do you? some little strings. Yes, yes, I can. So yeah, I don't so they, mix it, yes? You yes, don't mix, no. Mm -hmm. So these little strings is your DNA and little proteins. <laughs> okay, guys, uh, please keep experimenting. Please take pictures of your plants in all the moments. So you will have a lot of different pictures to work with, uh, with Maria in two days. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this little talk and talking about bio art, making experiments in your home. Uh, I think that this is the trend of like, what is now very trendy, the biohacking. Um, if you have any questions, please write me. Uh, I, you already have my Telegram and my email. Uh, and then you can also visit here in this code the um, Center of the Art and Science, the website of the Art and Science Center, sorry. And uh, I think um, I will also send you now in the chat this presentation so you can have it. And if you still have time, because we already passed almost 20 minutes after or that deadline for the course. Uh, but if you still have time, uh, I invite you to have a small game. Now um, I will send you a link and it will be a quiz regarding today practice. And let's see who gets more points. And if not, you are very welcome to also leave and uh, see you soon. I will be also the next session. Write me if you have any questions. And here I'm gonna send you uh, the link that you can open if you're in your computer or in your um, <clears throat> in your cell phone even. So if you open it, uh, it will look like to enter a pin, right? Yeah. Okay. So. Let me share my screen, sorry. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, Christiana, yes, please send pictures, take pictures when you made your experiment. Thank you for writing. So it should look like this, your, your screen. And the number that you will put is the one that's now in my screen. Uh, I can tell you 84133310. It will ask you to put your name. Mm -hmm. Christiana, Henry, Angel. Okay, is everyone or are we waiting for someone else? Aliona, uh -huh. uh, sorry, is Aliona or Alena? How, how can I count? Uh, Aliona. <laughs> Aliona, okay. <laughs> then, then yes, it's Russian. Okay, uh, Randy, are you joining? Is anyone Wait, else? Wait. Okay. So um, this little quiz, uh, you will see. I, I hope you will see the the, pick, the question, and then you need to select the color in your screen of the correct answer. So maybe you can make like a small uh, the window with this screen. Mm -hmm. So everyone is here, right? Should I wait for someone else? No? Okay, so you will have the question in this screen of the Zoom and you select the correct answer in your own screen. So it's called Bioart 1. <laughs> So, in what year Fleming made the first picture of bacteria? Ah, no, I will say. Do, do you see the colors? You need to select, and time's up. Okay, good. <laughs> so, who is? The first one. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I cannot pronounce yes, Yeah, yeah. If you yeah. yeah, if you answer faster, you receive more points. So first place, uh, yes, one, then Henry, Christiana, good. Let's see the next one. What is the name of this artwork? Who presented this artwork? You remember the name? Mm -hmm. Or not. Nobody presents this artwork, right? Ah, yeah, it was selected, but in, in, Angel was not telling the artwork. <laughs> but do you know this? Oops. <laughs> Pigeon Dior. So they basically modified the guts of the pigeons to make soap with their poop. So when a uh, pigeon poop in your car, you can just put water and clean it as a, as a soap. Okay, Alexandra, now you are in the first place. What ingredient is responsible to break cell membranes? Detergent, salt, ethanol, or bleach? Aha, okay, detergent. Wow. <laughs> yeah, the detergent, it takes the, the membrane uh, molecules. And the, the bleach actually just uh, remove the colors. So yeah, Randy, now you are in the first place. Next one. What breaks the nuclear membrane to let out the DNA? Uh 
Aha, salt, good. Okay, the salt, it breaks the nuclear membrane inside the cell. Okay, yeah, it's a good competition. Christiane is back in the first place. Okay, who are, I told you about two pioneers of bioart. <laughs> Thank you very much for the person that put the red one, but no, in this Martha Domeneses and Eduardo Katz. Very good. Okay, Christian is on fire. Excellent. Okay, true or false? Is bioart a practice where humans work with live living tissues, living organisms, and life processes as subjects? Aha, uh -huh. so why, why false? Maybe there was something there that you could add? Maybe we could add there is about the philosophy, the concept behind, to collaborate. Yeah, I think this uh, description is very short, but in general, that can be summarized about bio art. Okay, the next, I think, is almost the last one. In which year American scientists could obtain whole cellless, like without cell hearts? When they remove all the cells for first time of a whole organ. Yeah, good, 2008. So who is in the first place now? Oh, Christiana, you are going to get an A plus in the course. <laughs> nice. And <laughs> the next, what do you think? Is it possible to transfer a skin of Medusa to human? Three, two, one. Yes, correct. It is possible. It is possible because there is no uh, reaction into uh, our immune system against the skin of the Medusa because there is no DNA. It's just a polymer like cellulose as well as the cellulose from the plants. So we can transfer a skin of Medusa into, into human skin. So let's see the podium. In the third place, we have Barb, Barbara, congratulations. Then we have Alexandra and A plus, kudos to Christiana. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> okay, guys, thank you very much for staying to the end. <laughs> it was a thank pleasure you. to meet you. Uh, I thank will you. be next to you in the next sessions um thank you very much for being here see you soon stay in contact and any questions do not hesitate and write to me okay have a great yeah. night day a good life bye -bye. <laughs> thank yeah. you bye. bye thank you bye bye bye